What's up guys, this is Kate Limited. Welcome to episode 18 of Spill the Tear, which is my podcast where I talk about JRPG news, releases, mechanics, what I've been playing, want to play, and more. And this week we're going to be talking about me continuing to play Wuthering Waves, how I'm looking forward to Urban Myth Dissolution Center, there's some Dragon Ball Sparking Zero news, and more. And before we get into the podcast, I don't really have too much to talk about in terms of like the housekeeping stuff, so I just want to mention that if you are listening on audio services, remember to 5 star this podcast, that helps a lot. If you're watching the video version, like it, that helps a bunch. Also, I do have a Twitter, at Spill the Tear, or x which it's called now so if you're gonna follow me on that feel free to i talk about games and whatever related to this channel which is nice and before we get started my one recommendation or thing i want to show and uh, this is a series that i love i watched this anime when i was like in high school then i reread it once i bought the manga and it's this for audio listeners i am showing the cover of volume one of bakuman which is a series about manga which is very cool so if you're pretty much if you read manga or watch anime i think this is like required reading like you really should read this or watch this it pretty much goes over the industry of manga how it's made but it's done in a shonen way so like the main character really wants to make manga he wants an anime made so that this girl he likes can voice in at some point it's pretty much his entire high school life of him trying to achieve that goal and i won't say much more than that it's really fucking cool it's really good if you have not watched or read it I recommend it and also it's done by the same people who made death note so if you know about that it's at the same quality honestly i prefer this more than death note so yes highly recommended and before we get started i'm gonna pick a random spirited away card as i usually do okay it all fell over my desk but this week's random card is this the two of spades it is the main character and her family driving to the spirited away location at the start of the movie so we are going to be starting on that note and i think this is the quickest we've done housekeeping so we're going to go straight into jrpg news so for this week we do have a decent amount of news for jrpgs as always i'm sourcing them from gamasu so if you want to check it out check them out they have a lot of nice news stories and uh first just to start off with the quick news stories and number one this is actually pretty exciting for me because i don't think they've done this before at least is the first time i'm hearing about it but uh as people probably know if you listen to this podcast i love trails games but trails through daybreak which is the newest one that's coming out on july uh released a demo they were planning to release a demo on june 4th and that day has passed so it's released and so you can play it on the ps4 and switch and yeah apparently from what i've read online it covers the prologue and chapter one and from just speculations online from people i don't know if this is true people are assuming that means it's about 10 hours long again i'm not 100 sure if that's true if that is true that's amazing i still think that the best demo ever so far is the dragon quest 11 demo because it's 10 hours and once you're done you can just transfer the data and so if you can do the same with this which it seems like it is going to be the same that's fucking amazing so this might be honestly a good way just to technically play the game early so just play this a day or two before the game comes out and then just go seamlessly into the game this would be like i think the best way to play it and uh, i still have to finish trails into reverie once i beat that i'm gonna go straight into this so yeah pretty cool to see because i don't think i've seen this with the trolls game before at least from my experience and uh yeah the next news story is metaphor refantasio more news about that they are going to have their second showcase on june 7th at 9 p.m eastern so that is two days from when i am recording this and yeah that's this is gonna be another showcase the last showcase was cool they showed a lot about the game so i'm very curious to see what they're gonna show in this one at least the last one i know there were some story bits but they showed a lot about the gameplay the world and kind of mechanics and things like that so i'm not sure what they're gonna focus on this one if they're gonna go even deeper into the gameplay or if they're going to show more about story but yeah that is something that's happening and i'll probably be covering that a bit more in my next episode so that is something that is happening too this friday next new story is persona 3 reload is having an expansion pass wave 2 that is launching on may 31st which includes a velvet costume and background music set which is kind of confusing because when i read this i'm like oh cool they have an expansion pass so i never played the game but I assume expansion pass usually means like a whole new story episode. But based on what I'm reading, it seems like it's just new costumes and a background music set, which is like whatever. That doesn't seem like a huge update, but that's from what I'm that's what I'm reading online. That's what it seems like. I'm not sure if it, if there is some kind of story episode, but yeah, that is something that's happening. And uh, funnily enough, so I'm reading the comments on this Gamatsu article, and it does seem like that people don't like this expansion pass it seems like a, be- a weird idea that is just velvet costume and uh, music so i guess i am correct that it's just that so yeah i i honestly don't consider that an expansion pass it just seems like like honestly this is something that you'd see on like the playstation store for like 99 cents a gram dlc bit so it is what it is that is the uh expansion pass for persona 3 but yeah moving on to the next new story is that there was a state of play that happened and i said that i would cover anything that's interesting or anything that's jrpg related and there's three games that i want to bring up that i thought were interesting personally and they look kind of jrpg-esque the first one is infinity nikki i didn't know what this was but apparently from looking into it more that it is a long-running series and this is just their newest 
you know iteration of it and when i saw it its visual style looked interesting it's a pretty visually nice looking game it looked like a 3d open world game and the way they describe it is an open world dress-up game so when i heard that i was like what does that mean and uh, honestly like i still don't know it seems like it is some kind of dress-up game that they've had but but they like kind of making huge jumps with each game and so with this one they decided to go open world with it so i'm not sure if it's a game i'll play if it's a dress-up game i still don't know what that means uh specifically but it does look like a jrpg because there was a like, combat and shit in it so like we'll see what it is when uh, more information comes out with it but infinity nikki definitely did look interesting another game from the state of play that i found interesting was called where winds meet it is kind of like a samurai-esque game honestly that's what i got from it, it looked like a cool samurai game it looked a lot like the last ronin or even sekiro a bit souls like and yeah that just looks very interesting from what i've seen and the last game was a monster hunter wilds which is kind of the next big monster hunter and uh i watched the trailer they pretty much just showed uh some gameplay it, it was some gameplay and some cinematics but them showing different monsters and how the fighting is with it and honestly it does look a bit more realistic which i kind of like where it feels like when you're fighting the monsters it does feel a lot more dangerous where my only experience with the series is playing some of monster hunter world and some of monster hunter rise so this looks cool because it looks kind of more like monster hunter to rise but with the coat of paint that monster hunter world had where it was a bit more realistic and more main series looking so monster hunter wilds is something that i'm looking forward to and yeah that was pretty much what i got out from the state of play if there's anything else that you thought was interesting leave it down in the comments below but yeah that's what i thought was interesting at least jrpg wise the next new story and the one that i'm most excited for is dragon ball sparking zero had a new trailer and i called it last week that i said that it would probably be a trailer about fusions and it exactly was and I called every single character they showed too. So pretty much they had a new character trailer, which they've been doing. They've been releasing character trailers. Um, I want to say every few weeks, maybe every month, which have been very nice. And uh, this one was focused on fusions. And in this trailer, they showed Gogeta, Vegito, Kefla, Gotenks, and Fusamasu. And of those characters, they also showed each of their individual characters, except for View Samasu, which I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if they're saving that for another trailer or not. Um, as we know, View Samasu is a fusion between Zamasu and Black. So I'm sure they want to save Black for like maybe its own specific trailer because he is a pretty huge character. So I'm, I think they're going to do it you know, for another trailer. But yeah, they showed Gogeta and they showed, and we've, we've had Goku and Vegeta, so they didn't really show that really. But they showed Gotenks, Goten, Trunks, Kefla, Kale, Kalifla and things like that and it's very cool seeing like a random bits where like when gotenks was using his volleyball super attack piccolo's the one that kind of set it up which we've seen um in the previous games and uh the thing that i found the most interesting honestly was that and i've mentioned this in a previous trailer too where they have these dialogues that happen in the trailer and i'm wondering if these actually happen within the game i think in a previous trailer there was kind of dialogue or a monologue from hit uh describing broly and obviously that never happens in the series because they never meet but like he's kind of talking about broly and i'm like does that actually happen in the game when would that happen would that be in a story mode but in this too they had that vegeto and gogeta were fighting and they were talking about each other so vegeto was kind of talking shit about gogeta and saying that the fusion dance is kind of dumb so i should be able to beat you and gogeta mentioning that this would be like a legendary fight between two blue warriors and so there's these very cool conversations happening between the characters that we've never seen in the series but i'm not sure when they would happen like would it just be stuff that's happening randomly as you're fighting or is it in a potential story mode but yeah that's something that i noticed that i thought was very interesting and in terms of gameplay i noticed that they're having a lot of like uh team stuff that they've been showing so in this gameplay specifically they showed like goten and trunks teaming up and using a super move same with kill and khalifa and i'm wondering how that actually works within the game at least with burka tenkaichi 3 and the past games whenever you want to fuse for example if you had both characters in your team they would be able to fuse so if you had goten and trunks in your team you'd be able to fuse them into go tanks and then you pretty much just lost one character in your in your roster so instead of five characters you now have four characters because you fused and so i'm wondering if this super move thing is similar where like if you if you're using goten and if you have trunks in your team you can use these team moves together i'm not sure i don't think this was something they had in the past Budokai Tekaji games but that's something i noticed from this trailer but yeah very interesting and i think most importantly they ended the trailer off with a t saying there's gonna be more dragon ball sparking zero news at summer games fest on friday june 7th so two days from when i'm recording this i'm very excited about that because i feel like if they're at an event they're going to be showing more than just a character trailer they might be showing more gameplay or more story or honestly just get more details our release date would be fucking awesome i feel like this is a game that could come like end of 2024 or early 2025 so we'll see but uh, i think whatever we get from summer games fest is going to be bigger than just a character trailer and i would like to see some more like 
more specific things about the game because if there's a story mode i want to see it or if they're really going all in on the local multiplayer i want to see that because burga takachi was a local multiplayer game at its base so we'll see how that goes but yeah that was the dragon ball sparkling zero news and from there we're gonna be going to a reynatis trailer there was a short trailer released for reynatis kind of showing more of the collaboration with uh the world ends with you i'm not gonna be talking about it specifically because i don't really know that much about the world ends with you and also it's a very short trailer they show um this character from the world ends with you is kind of like this uh female character she wears a black hoodie she's in it and they show the reynatis main character and they're talking i don't know anything about the world ends with you so i can't really talk about it but that is a trailer if you want to check it out that came out and lastly the last thing i want to talk about is rune factory project dragon released some more footage and details and i just brought this up because i always wanted to try a rune factory game but i never have i know it's mostly kind of like a farm sim game and i think there's like kind of stardew valley vibes but i know it's more like a jrpg so i've always wanted to try it, but i never have and what's interesting about this i kind of skimmed through the footage and this looks more like a modern game because the rune factory games i think are more like chibi like but this one kind of had more like full models that were shown in the gameplay which i thought was cool but what's really interesting is and i have this written down here is it seems like they're trying new stuff so for example there's two main characters subaru and kaguya and it says that they use a power of dance rather than farming to interact with the world around them whatever that means i'm not sure what that means because from what i know rune factory usually is like a farming type of game but it seems like they're moving away from that and they're focusing on dance which i don't know what that means and i think from the description they mentioned something like instead of using like you know farming tools are going to be using like drums for example to fight or something like that so it looks like they're taking a big step this is gonna be a different iteration we'll see how that goes because again i always thought about this as a farming game but maybe they're changing it with this but yeah rune factory project dragon more details and footage was released of that and I, I think it looks cool i'm gonna keep my eye on it and that ends off our new section in spill the tea run from here we're gonna move on to the next segment which are jrpgs that are releasing this week in terms of jrpgs releasing this week they are absolutely zero so usually i source from rpg site.net and i couldn't see any jrpgs that are releasing in the week of june 2nd to june 8th so i thought i would just mention one game that technically isn't a jrpg it's an rpg but it looked kind of cool to me so i'm gonna mention it it is called Crystalla that is releasing oh i didn't even write down the day let me check that real quick Crystalla is coming out on june 6th on pc as early access and i have the description here which i'll read real quick as a feral warrior blessed with the gift of Crystalla, you must master the six magic specialties of the sacred crystals to join ranks with the famed rock Saka warriors simultaneously you must uncover the source of a terrible curse that has transformed planet ailer's creatures into mutated monsters and the reason i'm bringing this game up is because it looked kind of interesting and i thought what was funny about it is that you're just you're just playing as a cat but you're playing as a cat in a very like dark setting it looks kind of like dark fantasy ish and so i thought that was very interesting where like you're playing as like, this funny looking cat warrior but you're in a dark setting it has real-time combat it looks kind of janky which is why it's an early access but it does look fun it looks kind of souls like in terms of the combat uh there's some form of traversal i noticed in the trailer they showed like a scene where like you're running as a cat they jumped up grabbed a tree branch kind of spun and then like launched off of that so there's some kind of parkour system perhaps uh but yeah it looked really cool and from what i can tell this is the developer's inaugural game so the developer's called astro clock tower studios and this is going to be their first game so i might keep an eye out for this but yeah it is something that looks kind of interesting to me not too interesting not fully in my wheelhouse but it did look cool and i wanted to mention something in the release date section because there was no actual jrpg but yeah from here we're going to move on to a jrpg mechanic that i think is dope now the jrpg mechanic that i want to talk about this week and this is going to be a hot take because i don't think i've ever seen a positive opinion about this it's usually like neutral but usually hate so i thought it'd be funny to kind of stir up some pots and talk about this but my hot take is gotcha systems in games are cool like they're they're nice they're fun they're like they're not a bad thing and so before people you know raise your pitchforks let me talk about why i think gotcha systems all they do overall is bring a means of motivation for some people to play that's all and different people have different motivations to play i usually play games for story i know some people play purely for gameplay some people play for difficulty some people may play for character writing some people may play for gotcha that's just maybe a thing they like play that they like to play a game for they just like that sensation of pulling things and one of the arguments i always hear kind of like against gotcha is that you know it wastes your money like you get addicted and blah 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 and obviously that is a thing that can happen to like people who are like heavily into gambling or addiction but i feel like if we want to talk about like the average person like i don't like i've played a bunch of gotcha games in my life 
Kingdom Hearts Unchained Key. I'm playing Mother Waves right now. I played Genshin Impact for a while. Dragon Ball Legends, Dokkan Battle. Like I've played like a bunch of gacha games over my life. Not once have I spent a single cent on a gacha game, and not once have I ever wanted to or felt like I had to. Like I don't know like what gacha games people are playing, but the, at least the ones that I play, they usually give you enough currency just to do free pulls. And on top of that, like I just I've I've never felt like I wanted to pull so bad that I would spend money on it. So like I just don't think that's really a relevant argument. Honestly, there are people who do get deep to addiction, and like I do acknowledge that. But if we're talking about the average person, I don't think the average person when they play these games gets so far fucking hooked like they want to spend all their money on gacha games i just do not believe that's true and so like i don't really see that argument as valid and there's another argument that people say like that the gacha system shouldn't be like the reason you play a game they think that like once you have it in the game it's unnecessary it gets in the way and is distracting and again i've never seen that too like for example wuthering waves is a game i'm playing right now it has a gacha system i straight up like forgot that the system existed like not once was a game like hey pull a character, pull a character, you must pull a character, hey, hey, here's the currency, pull the character, like, I never felt like that, ever, I think maybe, like, 15 hours in, I remember that was a system, and I just pulled, just for fun, and, like, I got some weapons or something, I'm like, okay, cool, and then I just, like, kept playing, like, it's just, like, I don't, I don't see how a gacha system is ever distracting, because I, I've, I've straight up seen arguments online of people being like, oh, I'm playing this game, I'm enjoying it, but man, the gacha system, I hate it, like, why is it there, like, why, why, why do you hate it, just play the fucking game, if you don't like it, play it, if you do like the gacha system, pull. Like, it's that simple. And so, that's just my take that I want to give on gacha, got the gacha system. Because, like, I've just seen so much people talk shit about it. And, of course, I acknowledge that there probably are some games that, like, really force you to do it. Like, if there's a game where they're giving you no currency and they're forcing you to pull to continue the game, sure, that may be a thing. In that case, that's a bad game. I just haven't played a game like that. I've played probably tens of gacha games in my life and I've never had a game like that. And so, if there are games like that, that sucks, but I feel like the average gacha game is fine. They never really force it on you. There's enough currency to do free pulls, and you really don't ever need to do pulls to really continue the game. Like you're just able to naturally play the game, get enough currency, pull characters as you need, and continue on. And yeah, that's pretty much my take on it. And the last thing I will say that I think will kind of stir stir something for people, but if you have a problem with gacha systems, as in like you think that they force you to you know use your money. I personally think that's more an issue on you and not the game. Like, I, I legitimately think that's just a self-control issue. Like, if you're playing a game, a mobile game, and you're like, oh, fuck, and you spend $5 for, like, the, sp the spin or this pull or whatever, it's like, you gotta fix that yourself. That's on you. That's not the game. But yeah, I would just end with that, that uh, I do like gacha systems and games. I don't think there's any issue with them as long as they're done right. And yeah, that's a JRPG mechanic that I want to talk about that I think is quite cool. And uh, from here on, we'll go to the next segment, which is a JRPG that I'm looking forward to. The JRPG that I'm looking forward to this week is a game called Urban Myth Dissolution Center. Now, this is a game that I've actually been seeing on my Twitter for a while, and it's because I follow this company called Shueisha Games, which I believe are a publisher, and they've been tweeting about this game. And this game's always looked interesting to me visually, but let me read the logline real quick, which is, join forces with a psychic director of the Urban Myth Dissolution Center and solve a variety of cases involving cursed relics, rental properties with shady histories, and dimensional anomalies. Monstrous oddities and otherworldly planes abound in this occult mystery adventure game. And I thought this game looked pretty cool. Pretty much the art style is like a pixelated art style, but it's, if I want to describe it, like imagine like an anime style game, but uh, a pixel filter over it where like, it's not like a pixel style like Final Fantasy 4 or something like an old ass style pixel game. It is like a modern looking anime type game, but with a pixel filter over it. And from what I can tell, it looks kind of like a visual novel-esque-ish game where they're trying to tell a story, a mystery story, but it's done with this cool art style. And they have a very cool color palette where everything is mostly blue, but they'll have some things that are red. And I thought this was very cool because I think this may be a hot take, honestly, but like, I like how pixel art styles look. Like, I, for example, Final Fantasy IV, I played that recently. I really liked how it looked. But I don't think modern games have to be in that art style because... I honestly don't get anything out of it. Honestly, what it really is that I'm talking specifically about the old style pixel art is that it's just less detailed art. So if you have like a character in that kind of art style, unless you have like in a high resolution drawing of how that character looks, I have no idea what that fucking character looks like. And so that pixel art style just really doesn't help. Whereas in this case, where they're drawing things in high detail in pixel art, I think it really adds to the style. And honestly, adds to the creepy vibes of it where like everything is very jagged, very 
very visceral looking for some reason. Like it's a very creepy style, and the, I think the pixel arts are really helps with it, along with the color palette. So yeah, it looks very cool. It uh, is detailed as like a 3D art game or a hand drawn game would be. And yeah, the only feedback honestly that I have with the game for me looking at it is, again, it's a mystery game and the, it's a, like a text based game. And for some reason, this is the first thing I noticed about games, and it really makes them look low budget. I don't know if this game is a low budget one or not, but like, please, for the love of God, if this game is going to come out, make it have a custom font that matches the art style of the game. So like I mentioned, it is a pixel based game. Literally everything is pixel based from the art style. And then you look at the font, it looks like Calibri or like Arial. And like, it just like takes me out so hard. And I'm like, what are you doing? You spend so much time and effort on the art style. You couldn't spend like a bit of time to make your own font. Like just make a pixel based font and use that and you're good. If you don't want to do that, buy a pixel based font and use that and you're good. Buying a font is like five minutes of work. Do that or like make it like even making a font doesn't really take that long. I've done that before. And so like it just sucks where I'm like this game looks beautiful. Like it looks like so good. And then you look at the font and I'm like this like looks like you made it with like RPG Maker all of a sudden. Like come on. Like it's, 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 it's the smallest nitpick. But like I don't know if anyone else has like gone through this. But like there's so many games where like I look at them and they look good. And then you look at the font and I'm like god they clearly just look, chose like the first font that's available when they were making this game but yeah that is only like uh, you know feedback that i want to give everything else about this game looks cool it's a mystery game i love mystery games and our style looks cool and i'm gonna keep my eye on it but yeah urban myth dissolution center is what it's called and from here on we're gonna move on to the next segment which is what i've been playing now unlike the last couple of weeks of what i've been playing which have been very bloated this week i've just been playing wuthering waves and so this section isn't gonna be too long because i already talked about wuthering waves last week so this week it's honestly going to be a bit more of the same, but I still want to talk about it to, you know, mention any new things. But I was planning to continue Dragon Quest XI as I've been playing and Wuthering Waves. But last week, it was like 90% Dragon Quest XI and maybe like 10% Wuthering Waves. This week, which is 100% Wuthering Waves. I just got a lot more into it. The story was pulling me in. The gameplay was pulling me in. It being so accessible of just being on my phone was pulling me in. And so, yeah, Wuthering Waves is all I played. And I honestly love that it's a mobile game. And I, I guess I could like talk about this point right now, but... At least from the games I've played, Wuthering Waves clearly is like the apex of mobile games. Like, I, I'm going to talk about this more later, but like, there was this final boss fight that I fought. And when I, when I was experiencing that, I was like, holy fuck, you can do this in a mobile game? That's insane. It's, it's like, it, it felt like a true JRPG. It did not feel gimped at all at being on mobile. And unlike most people, I think the mobile controls are fine. Like, I was able to, again, like, I, I beat the final, I think it was the final boss of the story so far on mobile. It was completely fine. I'm able to fight hard bosses quite fine on my phone too. And I suck at games. So like, I don't think the mobile controls of this game are bad. And people will say that like, I just think they don't like mobile controls. But yeah, the mobile controls are good. I think this is like the apex of mobile games. One thing I will say is if you haven't played this, I do think if you are going to play on mobile, you probably need a good mobile device. So I play on my um, iPhone 15 Pro Max. So like this is, I believe this is still like the newest iPhone out right now. And even on this, there are times where like randomly, I think when it's loading an area in, it will literally just stutter to like, I kid you not, like it freezes for like three seconds, then it continues and freezes for three seconds and happens like that for like 10 seconds. Um, it doesn't really happen in gameplay, but depending on how heavy the load on your phone is, like there are some times where like it'll drop to like 20 FPS once in a while. Usually it is like 60 FPS ish, but I'm talking about on like an iPhone 15 Pro, which is like, you know, the peak of like, you know, games on phone right now. And so if you have an older iPhone or an older like Android phone or what have you, there may be a chance it won't run well. And if you're like really old, like I think someone I saw on Twitter was complaining that they weren't able to run the game and they had an iPhone 7. I think if you're in that camp, you probably can't play the game. I'm surprised that it's even available on iPhone 7. Like I feel like unless you have like an iPhone like 10 ish or 11 ish. You probably can't run this game, but I'm not, you know, completely sure. But at least based on my experience of playing on this, like, yeah, it is a pretty, like, heavy game. But to be fair, I am also playing on, like, some of the higher settings. But yeah, that is something I thought I would mention in case you didn't play this game and you want to try it out. But in terms of the actual game, I've been enjoying it. Like I mentioned, I believe I've done the story that's available. I did, like, this finale fight. Honestly, it felt like I was, like, finishing a game. That's how it kind of felt like it was built up. And yeah, I'm just, like, in the world. Some things that I like about this game... The writing is good of the story. I'm really liking the multiple types of quests. So even after finishing the story, they unlocked a new character quest. I mentioned this last week, but character quests are pretty much this very long quest line that focuses on a character. So last week I did the one, I believe his name was Jing Yang, I believe, which is kind of like that lion head guy. And uh, this time I have one for Jian. I just haven't done it yet because after doing the finale, I kind of want to slow down on the game a bit and maybe continue Dragon Quest XI again. And so that is a character quest I have. The blue side quests, I think, which are just like 
like the normal side quests in the game. I think they're done fantastically. Some of them are as easy as like you just gotta find something and give it to someone. And uh, some of them are just very deep. And what I love about the blue side quest is like some of them are shown in the world. So if you see a question mark on the map and you go to it and you talk to the person, you unlock a side quest. But some of them are random throughout the world and you literally would have no idea that they're there unless you just happen to find the thing and activate it. For example, I was exploring the world, I found a camp, no one was there, and there was a radio there, and I started listening to the radio, and they pretty much started, like, telling me stuff, like, through the radio, and then it, a side quest started, and it was a very long side quest about a robot who had, like, a partner, and the partner ended up di dying, and now the robot is waiting for the partner, and just eternally kind of waiting for the partner to come back, and you have to do a lot of things for the robot and fix it up and things like that. And I would have never experienced a side quest unless I just happened to walk up to the camp and listen to that radio. There's a universe where I just walked up to the camp and just didn't even notice the radio and just kept walking. Like, it's so cool that there's an entire side quest. It was very long that was like that. Now, what's even cooler is that there was a sub side quest. So as I was doing that quest, I went into a bad guy camp and I read a poster and they were having a shooting competition and I had to infiltrate the shooting competition and do it to get a part to help that robot. So they had a side quest within a side quest, which again, I wouldn't experience if I hadn't found that initial side quest. So not only are these side quests kind of hidden, not only are they kind of deep, but I've noticed that they're, they're just really good at world building. So just knowing that there's kind of like bad guy camps doing shooting competitions, I thought was kind of funny. Like if they just like having fun together and slowly as you do it, you kind of figure out that like the one I was at at least was kind of a scam and he was just trying to get my money. But even something like that, it's just very funny knowing that there's things like that happening in the world. The story that the robot went through with his partner and that dying was very cool. And knowing that that robot just exists in the world waiting for its partner eternally is very cool to know in terms of like world building. So yeah, I think the side quests in this game so far have been done very well and I've been enjoying that a lot. I also want to talk about how the game does tutorial quests. I think the game has done tutorial quests in a very good way where like most other mobile games where they handhold you through a specific portion of the story and it would usually be very annoying where they kind of force you to like, you know, uh, go to main story, do mission one, you finish it. Okay, now you're going to learn about pulls here, go to the gotcha system, do pulls. And they force you to do that for at least like half an hour or something or an hour. And it's very annoying. With this game, had none of that right out right off the bat you get into the game you get to fight you get to enjoy the game and the way the tutorials have been done is that they're just naturally coming through the game so i've been playing this game for like i don't know how long i'm pretty much done the story from what they have right now and randomly still at this point i'm getting tutorial quests and then once i do them they kind of unlock a new feature of the game and it's done in this drip feeding natural way where like it feels good and it feels exciting honestly whenever i get a tutorial quest i'm like oh shit so i'm gonna unlock a new feature right now this deep into the game that's really cool and so like Stuff like unlocking a specific type of exchange shop or unlocking, I unlocked this feature called the Tower Adversity where you kind of get to fight against simulations. That's the thing I unlocked. I unlocked these very hard bosses in the world that are kind of like holograms. And the fact that I get to unlock them slowly throughout the game, I think is just like the best way to do it. Where like, if I started the game and they gave me all those fucking features right at the start and they forced me to go through them, I would have probably hated this game and I probably would have dropped it if I'm being honest. But the fact that they're drift feeding me through it and it's something that I honestly don't even have to do is like when I get the tutorial quest, the only reason I know I have it is because I check my quest myself and see the tutorial quest and then I go do it. It's not ever like they're like, okay, a new tutorial is unlocked. Okay, now you have to go to the tutorial and do it. So I think the tutorial quest, the way they've been handling this game has been done expertly too. Another feature that I want to talk about is the Sum Noir Gate. I think it's pronounced. It is pretty much this gate that's in the world that kind of leads you to another world. And I honestly very much like it. Pretty much it is a roguelike mode where like you go through, you get to fight. And after every round, you get to choose like one of three cards and upgrade yourself and keep on going through until you're done the level. I thought it was very fun. And I thought it was very cool because, because of two main things. One... At least from what I can tell, they give you enhancements that I haven't been able to experience in the main game. So for example, the main character has this one move where like he throws a sword and it kind of spins. Through this mode, I was able to get an enhancement where when I do that move, instead of one sword that spins, you get three swords that spin. And whenever I use that move in the in this mode, it's really fucking fun. I feel a lot more powerful and I kind of wish that I could do it in the real world but I can't yet, at least. At least, I don't know if you ever can do it in the real world, but I can't. And the fact that they have this enhancement in this mode was very fucking cool to see that, like, I'm able to do something completely different from my from what I'm able to do in the real world. And on top of that, you're able, you're able to do different things where, like, usually you have to go through the entire kind of level alone. You don't have partners, but through it, you're able to get partners. And what's funny is, you don't actually get to switch to the different partners and play as them, as you usually would do, but instead, you get to just use their ultimate. So if you press their face, you pretty much automatically use their ultimate, which I thought was very cool so the fact that they're actually making the gameplay 
very different from the main gameplay of the game, I thought was pretty interesting. And I really like that they have different upgrades. It's not like you just use one of three cards and that's all every wave. You get to do that. Sometimes there's a shop that opens up that you get to buy stuff from that upgrades you. Sometimes you get to enhance your character's moves, like I mentioned. There's so many different little upgrades that I thought that was very interesting to keep the mode feeling fresh. And the final thing about this mode that I want to talk about is, at least from when it started, there seems like there's some plot or story going on. So when you first get to the gate, there's this dude with a black mask, and he's called like Ebony Mask or something like that. And he pretty much introduces what the mode is, and he tells you to go through. And throughout the first level, slowly you go through, and you meet a guy with a white mask, and he's called Ivory Mask. And pretty much when you meet him, he's like, okay, yo, I'm, about, I'm here to help you. Whatever you do do not trust ebony mask like trust me do not trust him whatever you do like he is not good i'm i, I don't want to see him i've been in disguise so i wouldn't have to meet him but like do not trust ebony mask and that's all and what's weird is they haven't developed that storyline at all so I, I, th I feel like it's very cool that there's clearly some story going on here but i don't know what it's about and i've done this mode a few times now and like every mode you get to meet both of them separately but like there's clearly something going on story wise which hopefully gets some development soon which i'm really interested in so they didn't have to do that they really don't have to give a story for this mode, but the fact that they're doing it, I really appreciate it, and that's something I really like about the mode too. Also, one thing I want to mention about the enemies, and I've kind of spoke about this a bit last week, where I said that I really like that this game is focusing on the enemy and like what it actually is. Where some games, and I mentioned this last week too, like Dragon Quest XI, they have monsters. In that world, at least from what I'm playing, they're just monsters. They're not like special or anything they're, they're, uh, they're just monsters you gotta fight them and that's all whereas in this game the tds or tacit discords are the enemies they have like specific reasons behind what they are why they're here uh what they're about how you defeat them blah 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 they actually have lore behind them and i said that i found that interesting and uh what i want to talk about this week is that there was a side quest and what i thought was interesting about the side quest or i think it was an exploration quest specifically which are kind of like longer side quests but they had a plot line of discussing the fact that we may in the future try to coexist with TDs, which I thought was very interesting. So there's pretty much a few characters saying that they want to coexist with TDs, and there were other characters that said they don't want to. And nothing really came out of it from the side quest. It was just like a discussion point that they mentioned. But like, I just found it very interesting that they keep delving deeper into these enemies where like, these enemies are clearly very dangerous and we use these enemies, you know, in combat. But the fact that there are people and scientists in this world that think that they we can coexist with these monsters, I just found that honestly very fascinating. And hopefully like they dive deeper into this plot line into the future of the game because this is what i'm talking about when i say i really love world building going to specific parts of the world and the fact that they're going so deep into the enemies alone we're like they're talking about that you can coexist with them like how would they function in our society what would they be doing would they be pets would they be fucking slaves like i don't know like what would tds be and so the fact that they're actually talking about things like this in the game i found very interesting so hopefully they continue with this conversation about enemies in this game and the last thing i want to talk about Wuthering waves is uh story based so if you don't want any spoilers for the story of Wuthering waves i say just skip to the next segment because i'm just going to be ending the segment with this talk uh pretty much i just want to talk about that the finale of the story at least i believe is the finale from this part of the game was really fucking well done i mentioned this but like it, it straight up felt like i was playing the end of a jrpg like the way everything was building up the characters that i met before in the story were coming to help me the gameplay things are making me do i'm like yo this feels like the end of a jrpg and the fact that they're gonna obviously have more story and there's potentially gonna be more moments like this i was like god damn this is really cool and so to get into specifics pretty much um the the finale of the story is that you have to fight a threnodian which i still don't know what threnodian really is it seems like a very fucking dangerous and like big uh td and so you pretty much get to meet uh gn which is kind of like the general and you go to fight the threnodian but but what i find really cool is like the way it was done you have to slowly meet gn uh yang yang is with you you slowly meet gn you meet um i believe her name was jian shin which is kind of like the monk who's with you someone who you met previously in the story and then the four of you are pretty much trying to get to the Thronodian. they do kind of the trope which is kind of funny where like as you're going you kind of get a smaller and smaller party as some of your party members are staying back to kind of help you um, move forward and so by the time we're at the Thronodian, it's just me it's just GN and we have to fight the final boss and I thought the final boss was done fantastically I loved it it was very fucking cool and I love that it wasn't just like a straight up boss it's not like I just got to fight the boss and I was done you start fighting the boss with both of you then at some point they force you to use GN because he's able to apparently reflect shots with his kind of like spear weapon and so as you're playing as gn you have to like physically press the attack button and reflect all these shots of the bad guy then at some point he kind of gets attacked then you can't use him then you have to use rover and you have to fight only as rover which is the main character to fight the boss then while you're fighting the final boss a cutscene happens gn is back you control him again and it's like it's very fucking cool it's very epic as you're playing it and i thought the final boss was supremely well done it felt very epic 
And something I really loved about the story and I really noticed with the side quest is I realized that this game does its best to make sure that the story is completely accessible if you want. And if you don't want story, you don't have to play it in the future. And what I mean by that is, first of all, I'll talk about the second point first, but apparently they tweeted out that they're going to make an update in the future where you don't have to play the story. Like literally, if you want, you can skip the story and move on, which is like... That's cool for people who don't want to play the story. Like, they have that option. I like options for everyone. I would never do that. I fucking love story, but, like, that's cool to see. And on the kind of other end of the spectrum, what, what I want to talk about is they clearly made this story accessible to everyone. And the way I know that is when you're playing the story, you actually don't get to use your characters. You don't even get to use your main character. So when I was using Rover in the main story, it wasn't my Rover. It was, like, a trial version of Rover. It was uh, leveled up fully, even though mine is leveled up fully, too. But this one was leveled up fully. It had a different echo. And, like, it was a character that they made that I was using. The party members were ones that they kind of gave as part of the story. And, yeah, you pretty much get to use full-level characters and do the story. And I thought that was very cool because, like... Yeah, if I was playing the game and I only want to play the story and say my characters were just like level, I don't know, 30 right now, that doesn't stop me from playing the story. Like, I can still play the story because they gave me the level 50 characters, which is awesome. I also noticed other hints of this where when I was fighting the bosses, honestly, they were pretty easy. Like, they weren't that hard compared to like the bosses that they have kind of littered throughout the map, which are actually pretty hard. These story bosses were pretty easy, but they were still epic and enjoyable. That's exactly what I want from a story. I, I personally don't look for hard bosses in the story of a game. I don't think that's where hard bosses should be. They should be an extra thing. If I want to get to the story, I shouldn't need to deal with that, and this game did that specifically. They did this thing that as I was getting closer to the boss, uh, the general GN just kept healing me. So after every big boss fight, he's like, here's some heals, and he just heals me, and I'm, full, I'm back to full health again. Again, they're kind of making it very easy to get to the story. I honestly just appreciate all that. I think that was like a brilliant move and in this type of game, which can get grindy to some. The fact that they're giving such accessibility to the story, whether you want to play it or not, I thought was a good move. But yeah, those are my thoughts on what I've been playing with Wuthering Ways so far. I probably won't be talking about it next week because there's nothing else to play really in Wuthering Ways. I am still going to play it, probably just do the dailies and stuff, but like in terms of actual like story there isn't that much left i might i might do the character story and talk about that but yeah that's just something i want to mention but yeah from here on we will move on to our final segment which is the jrpg top casual list now the jrpg top casual list is a segment which is usually very quick it is a casual top list that i give my top list talk a bit about it and then the podcast is over so this week we're going to be talking about the top main menu screens now if you've played some banger jrpgs you would know that some jrpgs have dope ass menu screens and again this is a casual list i literally just picked three off the top of my head didn't think about it too much and i'm gonna be talking about it so my list is number three recency bias wuthering waves and number two trolls of cold steel and number one kingdom hearts 2 so starting with number three wuthering waves i just thought wuthering waves was cool uh the reason i'm even doing this list is because of wuthering waves when i looked at the menu screen i'm like this is really cool it just shows the male and female main characters kind of standing on a rock in kind of like an ocean and they're just there they're they're kind of uh clothes are flapping in the wind and when you you know press start to start the game and kind of zooms into the character you chose into their eye and the game starts very simple menu screen but it looks very fucking cool and it kind of gets you to the mood of the game which i really like number two is trolls of cold steel or honestly any trolls game um honestly this is just basically i like the music of trolls games so i just really really like the music in the main menu and also i believe this is true for the trails of cold steel games and i believe this is true for the azure game too where as you play the game the main menu will actually change. So like if you're at a certain chapter of the game, they will change how the main menu of the game looks to match that chapter. And the only reason I know this is whenever I get to the main screen, which is honestly, unfortunately, not that often anymore with the advent of the PlayStation 5 and rest mode. I'm never in the main screen. So for example, with Trails Azure, I played that. I saw the main screen when I first played the game, and the only other time I saw the main screen again was right before the final boss when the game, like, crashed or something, I think, and, like, I had to, like, start the game up again, and I noticed that the main menu was different, and it was actually matching, like, the chapter I was in, and I was like, oh, this is pretty fucking cool, it's like Crystal of Cold Steel, and it sucks that, like, that's something that I wasn't able to experience, because with rest mode on PlayStation, the game just opens up right away, like, you, you don't have to go through the main menu again, but I really do like the idea of Trills' main screen, where, like, it has their nice music, but it also matches where you are in the game, so it kind of feels more connected to what you're doing in the game currently so i thought that was very cool and number one is kingdom hearts 2 this is purely nostalgia i don't think this is objectively the best it's literally just sora on a white background you know with tetsuya nomura's beautiful art and obviously just kingdom hearts music dearly beloved is really fucking good and you just hear that 
iconic music while looking at the art is just very nostalgic for me it reminds me of my childhood and that's why it's at number one but yeah number three wilding waves number two trails of Cosilla, number one kingdom hearts 2 let me know your list down in the comments below and from here we will end episode 18 of spill the tiro i hope you guys enjoy this episode of spill the tiro hopefully i will see you in the next week's episode if you like this episode leave a like down below if you have any comments of anything i said leave it down below if you're listening on audio services leave five stars or rate it highly whatever it may be on your podcast app please i would very much appreciate it i am getting slightly more viewers on the audio front but if i could have even more that'd be even better if you are new subscribe if you are watching the video and want to listen on audio like i mentioned i am on audio services you can do that that's cool thank you guys for watching or listening hopefully i will see you guys next week for episode 19 peace mm -hmm.